Not. So if you remember, we mentioned that, 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 that there were two stories with Rabbi Akiva and his colleagues. First story is they're going to Rome. They see, they hear they're miles away from Rome. They hear the commotion. They start crying. He starts laughing. They say, why are you, he, they say, why are you laughing? He says, why are you crying? They say, these are the people who serve idols, destroy the temple. Or well, they don't say destroy the temple, serve idols. And they're sitting in peace and serenity. And we, the house of our God is destroyed. He says, that's why I'm happy. If for those who go against God's will, they get blessed this way. Those who perform God's will, how much more so? That was story number one. Story number two is they're going in the temple. They're, go they're, they're, going, to, they're going in Israel this time toward Jerusalem. They come to Mount Scopus, which is where you can see the Temple Mountain, which is why it get, get, gets its name. Our next Sophim, Sophes is some scouting. Uh, they could see the Temple Mountain. They tear their garments. That's the law. They reach the point. Um, they reach the point of the. Of, of, they actually come to the temple. They see a fox roaming in the place of the Holy of Holies. They cry. He laughs. Rabbi Akiva laughs. They say, "Why are you laughing?" He says, "Why are you crying?" They say, "This is a place where it says a foreigner is not allowed to walk here." And now there are fox and roaming. He says, that's why I'm laughing. This is why I laugh. And he gives his whole speech. There are two prophets. Isaiah quotes a verse where God says, Isaiah says that God says, I have two, I have two witnesses, one Uriah, and one Zechariah. And Rabbi Akiva says, why are you putting Uriah and Zechariah together? They don't live in the same period of time. One was in the first temple, one was in the second temple. But the Torah, Isaiah is relating the two, saying, that Uriah described the destruction, Zechariah described the rebuilding. So soon, old men and women will sit in peace in the city streets of Jerusalem. Rabbi Akiva says, "Until I did not know, until I didn't, until I, until I did not see the, the the prophecy of the destruction, I did not know that the prophecy of rebuilding will be fulfilled in the same way. Now that I see the prophecy of destruction." has been fulfilled. Now I know that the prophecy of the rebuilding will be fulfilled in its fullest. That was the story. We asked eight questions. I'm not going to go into the eight questions. I'll just give the kernel of the, of the, of the point. The kernel of the point was that the big dispute between Rabbi Akiva and his colleagues is what takes, um, what dominates over, over the other present or future. They are focused on the present. He is focused on the future. And that's why they're looking at the pain now. They're crying now. He says, yes, but there's something in the future that's coming. You have to focus on the future. And last week, we said that there are a lot of ramifications to this notion. And we said that when a person has, sometimes you have to make a choice, a lot of choice, where you have a choice either to do something greater in the future or do something in the present, even though it will not allow you to do something greater in the future. And the example was there are two fasts. There's Yom Kippur, which is biblical, much more important, seemingly. I mean, in many ways, much more important, I should say. And then there's the fast of, of Tzom Gedalia, the fast of Gedalia that, that's right after Yom Kippur, right after um, Rosh Hashanah. Now, what happens, suppose somebody knows that if he fasts on Rosh Hashanah, on Tzom Gedalia, the fast of Gedalia, he'll be too weak to fast of Yom Kippur. Should he ignore, not fast, on the fast of Gedalia, because in the future, he'll be able to fast, or on Yom Kippur, or should he just say, I'm focusing on the present, and right now there's an obligation to fast, I'm gonna fast now. The future is less important to me. So that is the debate, a halachic debate, two ways of looking at a scenario. And that is what we discussed last week in general. We had many more details, but in general, that's what we discussed last week. So now I think we're ready to tackle this week. Uh, in the meantime, if there are any questions or anybody wants any, if you have any questions or clarifications, please share. Otherwise, I assume we're ready to proceed. Again, you don't have to remember the last two discussions. You just have to have a handle on the two stories. And then you also have to put on your seatbelt and uh, get ready for the journey. Okay. One of the questions that we have not yet answered 
And that's the question we're going to focus on today is as follows, as you remember. The question that we still have not answered yet is the question of how come after the first story, sort of the sages, the colleagues were not convinced. They were not uh, comforted, right? The story, the first story ends where the sages Rabbi, um, put forth their opinion. Rabbi Akiva puts forth his opinion and that's it. And there's no, and there's no resolution. There's no, there's no resolution. It's like nobody convinced anybody. Everybody's exactly where they were before the conversation. So let me just share the screen. I'm going to try to share the, 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 and the story just so we can see it. It's always good to see the story. The, there's a quote that says, the letters make you wise. When you actually see the letters, you see the letters of Torah, it has, a, it has some wisdom in it. It gives you the wisdom. Okay. So, right, so this was, this is the end of the first story. They said, shall we not weep? In other words, they, right, they said like as follows. They said, um, end of the first story, they said to him, these Gentiles who bow to false gods and burn incense to idols, dwell securely and tranquilly in, a, in, in this colossal city. And for us, the house of, God, of, of the God, the house of the footstool of our God, the temple is burnt by fire and we shall not weep. Rabbi Akiva said to them, that is why I am laughing. If for those who violate his will, the wicked, it is so, and they are rewarded for their few good deeds, they, for, for the few good deeds they performed, for those who perform his will, all the more so, they will be rewarded. That's what Rabbi Akiva said. Were they convinced? Were the other sages sage convinced? No, no, I, don't, I don't know. Were they comforted? No, it doesn't say they were comforted. Then you have the second story. Second story was they were going to Jerusalem. As I said, it was a very long story because Rabbi Akiva gives a mini sermon in that story. But at the end, the Gemara adds, they sent to him, employing this formulation, Akiva, you have comforted us. Akiva, you have comforted us. We will return to you. Okay, this is what you say when you finish the track date. We will return to you and we have acquired track date Makos. That's what you say when you conclude the track date. In any case, after the second story, well, they say, Akiva, you have comforted us, and they say it twice. So one of the questions the Rebbe asked is what happened? How come Rabbi Akiva was convincing? They were able to, they were convinced after the first story, but they were not convinced after the second story. Okay, I'm Xing this. Unless you want to donate to Safari, you'll find it. But right now I'm Xing it because it's getting in my way. <laughs> okay. In any case, that was, a, that was a question. That was a very interesting question. Why is it that they were comforted at the second story, not the first story? Now, the Rebbe says, well, there is a commentator, the Maharsha, as we discussed him um, um, back then, well, two weeks ago, two, uh, two lessons ago. And the Maharsha says, look, it says it twice because they say, Akiva, you have comforted us. Akiva, you have comforted us. They say, it's, they say those words twice. One is for the second story and one is for the first story. That's, that's the Maharsha's answer. So indeed, they were comforted after the first story, but they said it after the second. The Rebbe says that's not such an easy, um, 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 not such an easy answer because these stories did not happen one after the other. There was a great distance to travel from Rome to Jerusalem. Had to have, you had to have at least a few weeks. So there were at least a few weeks in between, maybe more. So these stories in the, in the Talmud, they're next to each other. But in reality, when the first story unfolded, they didn't know the second story is going to unfold. So why was it that the rabbis were not comforted by the first story, but they were comforted by the second story? In other words, there's something so much deeper in the second story that the first story does not have. And that's what we want to elaborate upon. And we'll spend a few minutes on that. And then we're going to go to, and then we're going to go to um, getting a little bit more into the history and background of Rabbi Akiva, which explains why Rabbi Akiva specifically had his perspective as opposed to the other ones. Okay, why were the sages not convinced by the first story? So that we already explained last week because there is a philosophical difference between Rabbi Akiva and the sages. Rabbi, the sages believe you focus on the present. 
And Rabbi Akiva says, you focus on the future. So the fact, so now if you have two people with this, these, these divergent perspectives, Rabbi Akiva cannot convince the sages. What is he going to say? They're crying because of the present. What is he going to say? He's going to say the future is actually going to be bright. Okay, so what are the sages going to say? We agree that the future is bright. So when the future comes, we'll celebrate, right? In other words, there's no, there's no, Rabbi Akiva didn't convince them anything. He didn't give them anything that they didn't know up to that point. They always knew that now is the, 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 the current situation is negative. The future will be good. The problem is that they, the, the, their philosophy, that they, their philosophy was that you focus on the present as opposed to the future. In the scenario of the fasting, they would say, fast on the fast of Gedalia. The Kippur will worry about later, right? In the other scenario we brought about the circumcision, they would have their also opinion is focus on now, don't worry about the future so much. So Rabbi Akiva can't convince them because there is a philosophical dispute and everybody agrees upon all the facts. And Rabbi Akiva cannot add, did not add anything to their understanding of the scenario. Okay, fine. Comes the second story. And we already alluded to this last week. That's why it is just an elaboration of last week, but the, the kernel of this explanation was already put forth last week. The second interpretation, Rabbi Akiva, in the second story, Rabbi Akiva is telling them something much deeper than the first story. The first story he's saying, the, the current, the, 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 Current situation is bad, the future will be good, focus on the future. That's not good enough for the rabbis because they believe if it's a conflict between present and future, focus on the present. What is the second point Rabbi Akiva says? Mm -hmm. Rabbi second point Rabbi Akiva says is that the present, the present destruction is actually part of the future um, positivity. It's part of the future. So it's not like something bad is happening now, but later it's gonna to lead to something good. No, the current problem, the current ne negative situation is part of the positivity that will come about later, which is very hard to understand, but we already gave the kernel to this last week. And the, and the, and the verse that Rabbi Akiva quotes is Tzia in Sada Techaresh, Zion will be plowed like a field. In the process of plowing a field, you're not going to see the kernels yet. The stalks are not ready yet. But plowing the field is part of the process of the planting and the harvesting. And when you demolish something, you could look at the you could look at demolishing and you could say, so here's a here's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a demolition sign and they're crashing the house. And you're very upset because that means for the next two years you're going to have noise, right? In other words, you look at looking at the negativity. Rabbi Akiva says, why are you looking at the in the first story? Really, what Rabbi Akiva is saying is, why are you looking at the negativity? Can you imagine in two years there's going to be a beautiful home here? Celebrate the fact that in two years there'll be a beautiful home. The sages say, no, we don't do that. Because when we have a conflict between present and future, we look at the present. So they were not convinced by the first story. The second story, Rabbi Akiva says something much deeper. Rabbi Akiva says, understand that the demolition, as I mentioned last week. Demolition is part of the construction. Demolition, the negativity is part of the positive. So it's not negative now, positive later. The what appears to be negative is actually something positive. And that is something so profound and so deep that they have to agree because, they, that because when it comes to a conflict between present and future, they maintain their opinion. You focus on the present. But if Rabbi Akiva says the present is part of the building, ah, so we're focusing on the present. Okay, so you comforted us. So they were, their perspective was changed by the second story, not the first story. The first story had no ability because it's not really connected. The fact that Rome is successful now means that we'll be successful later is sort of too removed. Now is bad, later will be good. The second story, he says there are two prophets. There is the prophet of the, uh, and, and we know in Judaism, you need two, you, there was two witnesses, the two prophets, in Judaism, one, one witness doesn't get you anywhere. We read that last week's parsha. You need two witnesses, which means that the destruction would not be to the fullest extent, as we discussed last week, then the rebuilding would not be to the fullest extent. So just like the destruction was in the extreme, therefore the building will be in the, it will be, will be in the extreme. So the destruction in the extreme is critical and part of the rebuilding. Now they agree because they still maintain their philosophy that the present over 
uh, um, overpowers the future. But Rabbi Akiva said, you're misunderstanding the present. This is not a destruction. This is, a, this is construction. I say, Akiva, you comforted us. Akiva, you comforted us. Why double measure? That was another question I've asked. Why did they say it twice? Marsha says one is for the first story, one is for the second story. But we're rejecting that notion. So what does it mean twice? Akiva, you comforted us. Akiva, you comforted us. You comforted us in two dimensions. Number one, you told us that the future is bright. That's one level. Number two, you told us that the present is part of the rebuilding. That's the second dimension. And that's why they say there's a double measure of comfort. The future that's going to be good and the present that's part of that future. So now we understand a little bit about Rabbi Akiva's philosophy and how come, and how come even after the first story, if he could not sway them that the future should dominate the present, he was still able to comfort them in the second story because he explained to them that the present is actually, um, the present is actually part of the rebuilding. So the rebuilding is really happening now, even though all you see is tractor trailers destroying because you don't see the full picture, you're misunderstanding it. This is actually an act of rebuilding. So that is the story that's not, that basically concluded the, the two stories of Rabbi Akiva with the analysis. Now we wanna understand why is it that Rabbi Akiva has this skill that he is able to see within the act of destruction, he is able to see the, the, that this is part of the future rebuilding. What, is, what, it, what in his biography would lead him to that? By the way, if we had time, we can elaborate and say this is true in every person's life. Every person has a challenge. Every person has a destruction of the temple. Everybody's challenged in some way. So one way to look at it is now I'm suffering, but in the future, something else good will happen. And then you go into the question of Rabbi Akiva and the sages where, Rabbi, where, 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 where the sages say, I can't rejoice about the future. I'm focused on the now. Rabbi Akiva says, focus on the future. That's story number one. Story number two is a much deeper point. Story number two is understand that the struggle you're going through now is actually part of building the better future because this is making you a better person. This is making you a stronger person. This is building. This is not an act of, uh, of, 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 uh, of what it looks, which is just destruction. It's actually an act of building. And if you could see that in the present, that's a much, much deeper point because it's there's one thing about living in the future, and Rabbi Akiva believes you could, and the sages say, well, we don't really believe in living in the future. But the sages agree that if you could see that the present is actually part of the future, the present is part of the rebuilding, then you, have, then you get comfort in the present as well. So this story is not just a story about uh, 2,000 years ago in Talmudic times. This story really, literally happens every single day when we, whenever we face a challenge. It's our choice how we respond to it, and we have a whole spectrum. One spectrum, it's bad, but it's going to lead to something good. Or no, this is part of the construction. What's being constructed? I don't always know. Sometimes me. Sometimes I am becoming, I have the opportunity to grow out of this experience, right? Sometimes in the world around me. But the bottom line is Rabbi Akiva says something, something good is happening. And if you know how to do this, you could actually see in the challenge, see in the present, how this is actually part of the rebuilding, part of the construction. So make no mistake. A destruction is actually rebuilding. Okay, now what about Rabbi Akiva? How does this, how does this happen in, this, in his life? Okay, so there's two points. What we know about Rabbi Akiva's biography, there's gonna, there's gonna be two points that we're gonna talk about. Number one, there's not, not well known, but Rabbi Akiva was the son of converts. Son of a con, Ben Gerim, son of converts. He himself wasn't converted, but he was a son of converts, which means that he's coming from a different culture. As, and then, and then you have the second story, which is more well known, which is Rabbi Akiva did not start, start studying Torah until he was 40 years old, right? The famous story. He met uh, the, 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 the daughter of the, famous, of the wealthiest man in Jerusalem, Ra Rachel, the daughter of Kalba Savua, fell in love with him, and she wanted to marry him, and her father, her father cut all ties with her, and they were very poor. And the bottom line is she made him promise that if you ever have an opportunity to study Torah, would you take the opportunity? He said yes. So she said, okay, I'm going to marry you, and they got married. Eventually, he was out in the field, and he saw the water 
he saw he saw a stone. He saw next to the well, he saw a hole in the stone. So he asked the other shepherds who made the hole in the stone. And they said, nobody. They said, it's the water. The water drips every day. Every, every moment there's drips. The water's dripping on the stone and the water um, um, chisels a hole through the stone. And Rabbi Akiva said, if the water could make a hole in the stone, then the waters of Torah can break through my heart and, and get into my head. And that was at age 40. And he began to study Torah and he became the greatest sage of Israel and perhaps the greatest sages of all times because all the Mishnah and all the commentaries and all the Tosefta all are based on Rabbi Akiva's, Rabbi Akiva's tradition that he passed on to us. So that's the two points of biography of Rabbi Akiva. So the first thing we'll think about it is like this. When you have, when you have, the other sages are all very distinguished Jews. The Rebbe says that's why the, Mish, the, the, the Mishnah mentions exactly the names. It doesn't say, one of the questions, well, why do you have to mention the list of names? Say Rabbi Akiva and the sages. We say, no, it was Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah, Rabbi Yeshua. It mentions the names. So what do we know about those people? They were all distinguished people. Rabbi Gamliel was the Nasi, he was the chief of the Jewish court. He was from the tribe of Judah. Blessed ben Azariah was a, was a priest. He was also the 10th generation for Ezra. Ezra, Ezra the person who came and uh, rebuilt the second temple. And Rabbi Yoshua was a levy. He was from the people who would sing music in the temple. So these are all distinguished people. And Rabbi Akiva is the person who comes from a foreign culture. So now, what is Rabbi Akiva's point? Rabbi Akiva's point is that the negative, negative experience can actually be part of the holy experience. In other words, negativity could be transformed to holiness. The other sages don't know about this. Nothing in their own life expresses this idea. They were born into holiness. They were always within the realm of holiness and they did not have much, much interaction with, with a world that's not holy. Rabbi Akiva and his own personal family, they come from their converts, but this doesn't just mean they convert to Judaism, but they're coming from a culture that was negative at the time. And they're transforming themselves and they're becoming Jewish people. So they understand the concept of itapka, of transformation. That's something negative, even though it seems negative, it can actually be transformed to positive and therefore it's part of the, of, of the process of growth. That's one point. Another point, we said Rabbi Akiva is the guy who can, who can focus on the future. Now, if he would not have this skill, he would not be able to start studying Torah at the age of 40 because it's a very difficult thing to do because you look at yourself and you say, I'm not the person I wanna be, I'm so behind. I'm the level of a first grader. I don't know the alphabet and I'm 40 years old and you're gonna be discouraged. How do you have, how could you have the, the courage to try and ultimately succeed to grow because you're future focused. He is able to see the future in the present and that's the motivation and that's what Rabbi Akiva is able to do this. Today in psychology, they say that there's, um, there's something called, you have to envision the success, right? You're not just try, but you have to really picture yourself as if I am have, I've achieved what I want to achieve. And that is the motivation. And Rabbi Akiva, because of his philosophy, that he says, if I look at the present and the future, to me, the future is more dominance. That's why he was able to become who he was at the age of at the age of, uh, begin at the age of 40 and become the greatest age. Because he is able to, um, he is able to see the future in the present. And then there's one more point that Rebbe adds, and this is, a, this is, this is very uh, mystical. This is based on a letter that Maimonides wrote. There was a famous, there was a, a, there wasn't one of the, one of the students of Maimonides was a man called Rabbi Avadia Gerhat Sedek, Rabbi Avadia, the, the, the righteous convert. And this man converted to Judaism and he had a correspondence with Maimonides and some of it we have today. And one of the things that Rabbi, that this convert asked Maimonides, is he says, in the prayers, we thank God. We say, God is the God of our ancestors. So Rabbi Avadia says, look, my ancestors were not Jewish. So when I pray, how could I say that God is the God of our ancestors? He's not my ancestor. God wasn't the God of my ancestors. So that was sort of a halachic question that, that, that Rabbi Avadia asked Maimonides. And my guess is that Maimonides understood 
that when you're asking a question, what Rabbi Akiva, what, what, the, what the guy really wants to understand is what is his place within Judaism? Is he a second class citizen because his parents were not, or his ancestors were not Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? So there's a deeper question, right? You, know, you always know the first, the only thing you teach you as a rabbi is when someone asks you a question, is the question and what's that, what they're really asking. And there's a very famous story, a beautiful story of, I think it's Rabbi Soloveitchik, one of the earlier ones. Um, I, I, the famous story is that, that uh, somebody comes to him right before the day, middle, the Eve, Passover Eve, Arab Pesach. And he says, can I fulfill my obligation to drink four cups of wine with four cups of milk? Rabbi looks at him and says, you know, it's a very, very difficult question. I'm going to have to look and research. It's going to take me a few hours. I don't have the time. Here, here is money. Go buy yourself some wine. And you know what? Buy yourself everything else. It gives him a lot of money. And he says, go, come back after the holiday. We'll discuss the halachic ruling if you're allowed to fulfill your obligation of four cups of wine with milk. So he leaves. So when he leaves, the rabbits and asks him, I don't understand. It's an easy question. Any kid would tell you, you can't fulfill the obligation with milk. And also, if you're giving him more money, just give him money for wine. Why are you giving him money? Why are you giving money to buy all the, all the, whole, the whole dinner? So he said, you don't understand the question. If a guy asked me, could I fulfill the obligation for four cups of wine with milk means he doesn't have money for wine. Now, if he doesn't have money for wine, he certainly doesn't have money for roasts. And he probably doesn't have money for matzah. And so this real question is, is Rabbi, what should I do? I, can't, I don't have anything for the Seder. That's, that's the question. And therefore, my answer was the right answer. If you tell the guy you can't fulfill your obligation with a cup of milk, it's the wrong answer. You're not answering the right answer, right? So there's the question and then what the real question is. So I think that with Rabbi Avadi, when he asked the, uh, the Rambam about, can I say in my prayer that God is the God of my fathers? He's asking the technical question, but beneath this technical question is a deeper question. So Maimonides gives two answers. First of all, he says, you could say it, no problem. Why? Because you are a spiritual descendant of Abraham. And Abraham is the father of all converts. Abraham was a convert. You are closer to Abraham than we are. Why? We're a descendant of Abraham, but Abraham was the one who discovered God. You discovered God. Abraham's children did discover God. In some, in some sense, Abraham is the father for the converts even more, than, even more than the father of the Jews. He didn't say that, but he said Abraham is the father of the converts. That's the first, that's the first thing he says. That's the answer, technical answer, why when you pray, you could say the God of our ancestors. Fine. Then, he says, look, but he says, I want you to understand something. I want you to understand that our patriarchs, the patriarchs of the Jewish people are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who is the patriarch of the converts? He says, that's not Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who is the patriarch? The patriarch is God himself. In other words, your yichus, your lineage is even greater than the Jewish lineage because the Jewish lineage is to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were nice people. They were good people. Um, um, they were, they were righteous, uh, 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 everything is good, nothing wrong, but they're not God. He's a convert, the father of God is the con father of converts. Those are, those are, those are, those are the points that, that Maimonides writes to this gentleman, Abi uh, Avadia, the, the, the Gare. Now, when the Rebbe talks about this idea, he says, look, there's the human perspective and there's a the divine perspective. Rabbi Akiva, because his, his patriarch is God, he's much closer to the divine perspective. The great sages of Israel, even though they are great, they're, they, they, they're, they're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They have the human perspective. And the human perspective is different than the divine perspective in two ways. Number one, the human perspective is much more limited to time. There's present, there's future, the present is real, the future is tangible, is coming in the future, may or may, future is intangible, may or may not come, things may change. In the human perspective, um, present and future are two separate dimensions. In the divine perspective, Present and future are one. Hashem is past, present, and future as one. As one. So Rabbi Akiva is able to tap into the energy that you're able to see the future and the present much more than the other sages because the other sages, they're coming from the human perspective. And the human perspective, it's much harder to feel the future and the present. But Rabbi Akiva, because he's connected, because he's the son of the convert, and, and, and like Rambam says, the lineage of the convert is God himself it's easier for him to tap into the divine perspective, which is above time. That's one point. Another point, from the perspective of God, there's no evil in the world. Everything happens for a reason and God sees the good in everything. The human perspective, we're not able to see it. That's why it is specifically Rabbi Akiva who's much more connected to the divine perspective because he's a descendant of converts. He is able to, tell the, to, to explain to the sages that although from your perspective, 
the destruction seems to be a very powerful destruction, something negative. That's the human perspective. But the divine perspective is that Hashem himself, that, that there's nothing evil that comes from above. And even the destruction is actually part of a greater construction that something greater will happen in the future. And this world, the next world, I don't know. I'm, I'm, we, we don't understand things that, the things that Hashem does, but that's already a different discussion. But the fact of the matter is from the perspective of Hashem, every negative is part of the construction process of the positive. And that's why specifically Rabbi Akiva is able to enlighten these, the sages on these two points. Number one, we understand why in his mind, the future is more dominant because he's able to be beyond the limitations of present and future because he's connected to the divine perspective. And then the second point is, and, and the second point, he was actually, he wasn't able to persuade them about the first point because they say, no, we still look at the present. But he was able to persuade them on the second point that what looks to you evil is only from the human perspective, but from the divine perspective, the destruction is actually part of a construction that they agreed and they said, Akiva, you comforted us. And that too comes to him specifically because he is the son of converts, meaning a descendant of the patriarch who is God himself. And in the divine perspective, nothing bad comes from above. It's only from our perspective, it appears to be bad. But from Hashem's perspective, Hashem sees how it's not bad. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is a story in short, very profound. And if we had the time, we could literally think about this now, it applies to our life. Um, we would have to make a fabrengen to do that, a city gathering to sit and really dissect and apply because study is nice, but application is more important. Um, but unfortunately, the time is limited, so we'll call it a day for now. And at some point, we'll make a Hasidic gathering, and we'll try to say l'chaim and apply the issues. Um, that's the story in short. Um, it, 